who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Mm -hmm. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Father, thank you for this mighty portion of Scripture that just reveals how you strengthened the Apostle Paul to endure so much affliction and opposition in his life. And God, we pray that you would equip us as well. We don't want to be in a place in our lives where we're so overcome by our circumstances or by the difficulty that we throw in the towel, God, that we give up, that we quit on the calling that you have for each of us, that unique plan that you have for our lives. God, we want to be faithful. We want to see it through. And so, God, we pray tonight that you would equip us. We want to hear one day those words From the lips of Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. You can have a seat tonight. Hey, one reason I think uh, that, one reason I think that um, there aren't more people serving God, I'm not saying this is the only reason. But I think that one reason why there aren't more people that have devoted themselves to service, and I'm not talking pastoral service, worship service, being an elder, I'm just talking about serving God, using the gifts that God has given to you. One reason I think that there aren't more people serving is because it's hard to serve sometimes. It is difficult to serve sometimes. When you really dedicate yourself um, to to execute what it is that God has laid on your heart, when you lay your life down for the sake of the gospel, when you pick up the mantle of servanthood that that we're all supposed to, to pick up, you know, there's opposition and difficulty in your life like you've never experienced before. Things just get tough. And there's a reason things get tough. One of the reasons is the devil doesn't want you to serve. The devil doesn't want you using your spiritual gift. The, the devil doesn't want you engaged in what God is doing to see his kingdom um, come here on earth as it is in heaven. And so he will do everything he can to make it difficult. Now, the great thing about all of it is um, that God is so omnipotent. He is so in control. He is so over everything that he can even use the opposition that the devil has against you. He can even use it for his glory. God can even use it for your gain. And tonight, listen, tonight, this is what we see in the Apostle Paul's life. In fact, um, in the previous verses, man, he said some strong stuff. These are some of the most, some of the most personal autobiographical terms that the Apostle Paul has ever used. I mean, there's a self-disclosure here from the Apostle Um, almost in a way that's unique to anything else he ever wrote. Um, And he said things. He was just honest. Man, we're hard-pressed, verse 8. We're hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We're perplexed. Uh, In other words, look, we don't always understand. We don't always see the end. In fact, it's very rare that we see the end of what God is doing when we're in the middle of it. But he says we're not in despair. Persecuted. Gone after. Um, we are the, the, the target of many people, and in a physical sense as well, but not forsaken. 
You know, amazing thing that the Apostle Paul could say, even though everyone may be against us, we have not been forsaken by God. Struck down, uh, physical suffering, physical pain, beaten down, but not destroyed, down, but not out. And you look at what the Apostle Paul went through, and you probably aren't, you, you know, like on the one hand, you might pray, God, use me like you used Paul. I just... I just want to see you do that mighty work. You probably don't pray, God, allow me to suffer like Paul suffered. That's probably not part of your prayer request. Um, But nevertheless, look, if you choose to serve God, there will be opposition, difficulty, and suffering in your life. How did he navigate it? Well, um, the, the verses that we just read give some of the principles that, um, you know, guided Paul through some of the most difficult periods of his life. And I think tonight, look, I want to, my hope is that we're all serving God. My (laughs) You're like, nope, what's chapter five say? Um, My hope is that we're all using our spiritual gifts. My hope is that we're not pew potatoes. My hope is that we're not consumer Christians. My hope is that we don't just seek his hand, but we seek his face as well. You know, my hope is that all of the spiritual gifts that are represented in this room are stirred for the glory of God. Like God has given you a gift for a reason, not to bury it, you know, like the parable of the talents. But God wants you investing those gifts and those talents um, and those abilities that he's uniquely blessed you with. You may be here thinking tonight, I don't have anything to offer God. Well, in and of yourself, that's true. You don't. In fact, you're a liability to the kingdom. And so am I. So am I apart from God. I'm a total liability. But you know what? God is greater than our liabilities. And he has placed things within us that he wants us to use for the edification of the body of Christ for the fulfillment of the great commission. So whatever has been keeping you on the sidelines, you know, what is, whatever has, um, you know, kept you in a spot where you're watching from the bleachers, it's time to get out of the bleachers, it's time to stop riding the pine, um, it's time to get off of the sidelines, and it's time for you to get in the game. And this, this is what he said in verse 11, for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. Number one tonight, number one guiding principle, not necessarily in hierarchy, but in the order it's presented in the word tonight, number one guiding principle for the Apostle Paul when something like this My pain, your gain. My pain, your gain. Number one, he was willing to be delivered to death. He was willing to suffer. He was willing um, to more than just take it on the chin because he did it for Jesus' sake. Notice that in verse 11. We who live, my ministry team, the people that that God has raised up to plant churches and have um, an apostolic ministry in Asia, um, in Macedonia, we are always delivered to death. We are, in a sense, always suffering. We are always laying our lives on the line. Somebody a couple of weeks ago, I don't know if I shared this two Sunday nights ago, but somebody a couple of weeks ago after the service came and said to me, do you know the parable um, or the proverb of the turtle? Did I tell you guys this? Oh, it was just so good. So I said, no, I've never heard the proverb of the turtle. And this is, this is what he said. It's, it's, really, it's really deep. Don't laugh at me when I say it to you. But he said, the turtle never makes progress unless it sticks its neck out. Come on, say, oh, oh. I mean, come on, right? I think that, I think that that's so true. The, the turtle doesn't walk. You have two options in life. You can stay in your shell, You can stay in that comfortable, cozy, safe place, going nowhere, going nowhere for the kingdom of God, or you can choose to walk. But if you choose to walk, you are stretching your neck out and you are making yourself vulnerable. I'm saying to you tonight, it is worth it for the kingdom of God. And in a way, this is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, man, we stretched our necks out. We do it all the time. We're delivered to death and it's for Jesus' sake. 
Why? So that the life of Jesus would be manifested in our mortal flesh. In other words, Paul was willing to do anything because ultimately it was for the Lord. Number one, when you are serving God, when you stretch your neck out, when you choose to walk and not retract and hide in your shell, your main motivation is Jesus Christ. You do what you do for him. I can imagine sitting down with the Apostle Paul, and you know, he had a battered, beaten, broken, physical body. Could you imagine sitting down with him and just like mulling over the scars? Hey, what's that one for? Oh man, that's when, that's when I got stoned. You know, not like stone stone, but stoned. Stoned with stones. You guys, man, I don't know where your brain's at. That's when I got stoned with stones and was dragged out of the city of Lystra for dead. Man, I remember that. Oh, what about those scars on your back? Oh, that's when I was beaten with rods when I was planting the church at Philippi. You know, I talked to church planters today and they're like, oh, pastor, it's just so hard. I'm like, come here. I got a rod in my office. So let me tell you what Paul went through. No, I don't do that. But, you know, I just, there were visible wounds on his body, not even to mention the wounds on his heart. You know, at the end of his ministry, he was forsaken by everybody. Ministry hurts. Sticking your neck out for the Lord hurts. But every one of those scars was a love offering to God. It was a love offering to God. And at the end of the day, he was willing to do what he did because he did it for Jesus Christ. He loved Jesus enough to do anything and to go anywhere and to suffer anything and to give up any comfort. And I just would ask us tonight um, in a Christian culture that is so narcissistic and self-centered, are we willing to do the same thing? Do we love the Lord enough? Are we submitted and yielded and surrendered to him enough where we're willing to say to him, you know what, you left the throne of heaven for me you lived a perfect life. You condescended and took upon human flesh, and you allowed that flesh to be crucified on a cross. Lord, you did that for me. I will do anything. I will do anything for you. The Bible says in Mark 8, 35, for whoever desires to save his life. You guys know this one? Hmm. Yeah, something like that. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, listen, for my sake and the gospels will save it. The more you try to hold on to your life, your standard of living and your comfort, the more you will end up losing. Number one, he did it for Jesus. Um, number two, he did it for others. Notice this in verse, uh, let's see. 12, thank you. <laughs> so then death is working in us, but life in you. The second reason he was willing to go through what he went through was because he loved other people. Not only did he love the Lord, but he loved people. So the equation for him was this. Look, if, it, if ministry, if you knowing God means us dying, that's an okay equation for me. That's an okay equation for me. He was so burdened. Um, he was so moved. He was so desperate. Listen, he was so desperate to see people saved. And, and that motivation was love. He loved people. He not only loved them in a temporary sense, but he knew that their soul was eternal and valuable. Look, invaluable. You can't put a price tag on it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world but to lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Those are the words of Christ, and he's just simply conveying, you can take all of the treasure and heap it up into one pile, and that one pile of all of the world's treasure doesn't equal the worth of one single soul. And that's what Paul believed. And that's what compelled him to love people enough to lay down his life for them. The Bible says, greater love is no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. Again, like in our Christian culture, sometimes we just don't even think like that. Sometimes Christians won't even sacrifice the time to go to a prayer meeting. 
You know, if, we don't sac- if we're not willing to even sacrifice our time to go to a prayer meeting or be engaged in corporate worship on a regular basis together, then there's no way we, we will ever be willing to suffer for the sake of other people. And yet, this is the example that the Lord Jesus laid down for us. Acts chapter 4, verse 24, the disciples had uh, just been preaching the gospel. They were brought before the Sanhedrin. Um, they were... They demanded, the Sanhedrin demanded that uh, these men never preach in the name of Jesus again. Of course, they said, what is better for us, to obey God or to obey man? We'll, We'll choose obeying God. And then when they went back to the people, they all praised God and thanked him that they were worthy um, to suffer for the sake of Jesus Christ. John Henry Jowett said this, ministry that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. Ministry that accomplishes that costs nothing, accomplishes nothing. And then somebody else said this, the test of a true ministry is scars, not stars. And I think a lot of people want the stars. You know, a lot of people want the celebrityism. But the test of a true ministry isn't in the stars, it's in the scars. The third thing that I see in these verses that really compelled the Apostle Paul to be willing to suffer was that he did it for the Lord, he did it for others, and he did it in hope, verse 13. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised us up, raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. The final thing is this, and listen, never forget this. When ministry gets hard, when you step out in faith, you're like, you know what? I'm going to make some meals for these people that are suffering, and then all hell breaks loose. I am going to go down to Calvary Downtown Outreach, and I'm going to serve the poor, and things get crazy in your life. I am going to step out, and I'm going to serve in the children's ministry. And then what do you get? You get parents that aren't happy with the way that you're doing it. In those moments, you have to remember, why do you do what you do? If you don't remember, you're going to lose heart. And so you stay the course by remembering, number one, you do it for the Lord. Number two, you do it because you love other people. And number three, you do it because you do it in hope. Look, it is, it is never over for the Christian. When you suffer, when things are difficult, if there's physical suffering, whatever it might be, that is never the end of the story. Your present suffering is never the end of the story. Your resurrection... And the resurrection of those you are ministering to is the end of the story. And that end is just the beginning. This is what Paul says. He's like, look, we're not bummed out. Like, we're not just throwing our hands up in the air and saying, man, you know what? This is worth nothing. Because Paul was able to say, this isn't the end of the story. No matter what the devil is seeking to write over our lives, God has written a greater story. We know how the story ends. We all go to heaven. And we spend eternity with Jesus because of the power of the resurrection. And you can't lose sight of that. Look, you can't lose sight of that. Some, you know, the devil wants you. This is how he works, okay? There are all of these great things going on in your life. He stirs up turmoil and difficulty, and he wants you to be consumed by the small turmoil that he has stirred up in your life. He wants you to obsess on those things that are hard So you lose sight of those things that are good. And don't ever tell me that you've never been there. Don't ever tell me that God hasn't knocked on the door of your heart and said, hey, you know what? I think that you need need to adjust your perspective. I think you need to stop being consumed with those things that are difficult, and you need to remember those things that are good. When you stick your neck out on the line, when you serve the Lord, You do it with the hope of the resurrection in mind. You remember that what God is doing in your life is spreading grace to many. That's what serving God is all about. It is spreading the grace of God to many. And listen, sometimes the grace of God is spread through our suffering. Wow, you said amen. Um, (laughs) You're like, I ain't amen that, pastor. Sometimes... 
Sometimes the grace of God, this was how the early church grew. You know, the more the devil sought to destroy the early church, the faster it grew. God spread his grace to the known world, to the suffering of his people. This is why Tertullian, the great church father, said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The more blood of Christians that is spilled on the ground, the faster the church grows. And I'm just saying to you, um, this is an axiom, it's a spiritual principle because it was set forth by Christ himself. Look, the, the grace of God has come to us through the suffering of the Son. Grace, remember, is God's undeserved favor. We are infinitely ill-deserving, and God gives us what we don't deserve, but that gift of God's grace doesn't, it's not earned through our suffering It was earned through the suffering of Jesus Christ. So as the grace of God abounds, as the grace of God spreads, as people's lives are touched by the gospel, as you choose to be used, as you choose to stick your neck out and walk forward in your faith, as you choose to stir up the spiritual gift to see what God would do in your life, people's lives are touched by the grace of God. And that causes, the Bible says here in verse 15, that causes their hearts to abound with thanksgiving to the glory of God. It causes their, in other words, listen, people experience God through your willingness to lay down your life. People experience God, and when you really experience God, the reaction, the real reaction is gratitude and thanksgiving. Your heart is filled with an overwhelming gratitude for God for all that he has done in your life. The word abound here means to have a surplus. It means to increase. It means to have an excess. Um, It means to be in abundance. It's the same word that's used when Jesus fed the 5,000. There was, they were filled. They almost gluttoned themselves on bread and sardines. They were filled to overflowing and there was plenty left over. When there's a real, genuine, sincere move of God's Holy Spirit in your life, people will experience God And that experience of God will be characterized by a heart that is abounding with gratitude to the glory of God. So number one, listen, stay the course. Stay the course. If you're serving God and things are difficult, remember why you do what you do. Um, If you have been on the sidelines and you've not been using your gift, it is time to engage and it it is time to do something because you love the Lord Jesus Christ. You love other people, and you want hearts to be filled with gratitude for him. The second thing that we see, that was just point one, the second thing that we see is in verse 16. He goes on to say, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, that should like cause you to wonder, for our, how could he say that? For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, like this is packed, this verse is packed, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You guys with me on this one? Are you reading it? Are you reading it? Are you reading the words? Okay, every word is really important. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So he wraps up this chapter, and um, we know he's wrapping it up because he uses the word therefore. So in considering all of these previous things, Paul goes right back to what he said when he started the chapter. We do not lose heart. We are not going to throw the towel in. We are not going to give up. We're not going to... We're not going to shrink back to our shell. We're not going to hide in a cave. We're not going to be so overwhelmed that we let the world win. Paul says we're not going to do that. Even though this outward man is perishing, and by the way, that is just a reality. No matter how hard you try, no matter how much work you get done, day by day, year after year, you know that this physical body is perishing. Um, And you know there's a blessing in that because as the physical body is perishing, it should cause you to anticipate and desire the glorious eternal body that God has prepared for you. 
In fact, this is where he goes in chapter 5. You know, he's like, this tent, you know, we're going to put this tent off. This is not your mansion, church. This physical body that you have, you're like, well, you haven't looked at my body lately. (laughs) Whatever, I don't want to. Thank you very much. But I'm just telling you, no matter what it looks like, no matter what your physical body looks like, it's a tent. It is a temporary dwelling for your spirit and your soul. Your spirit and your soul is made for an eternal habitation, not made with hands, but prepared in the heavens for you. And so, you know, as you lament day by day, week after week, the body and the effect of gravity and all that comes with it, um, as you lament, remember that really what you ought to be doing is you ought to be anticipating because as a physical body perishes, Um, Day by day, we have one that is being prepared for us. I don't think he's just talking about the natural course of time here. I think he's also talking about um, the perishing of the mortal body through serving God. Sometimes I joke with some of our uh, ministry team, and I say, you know, I think that people should measure ministry years like dog years. I think think every, every year in the ministry is like, I don't know, you fill in the blank. I don't know how maybe it rolls for you, but... But um, and sometimes it can be hard and heavy on the physical body. It's just the truth. You know, our staff works so hard, and they'll never say it. They'll never say it to you. They are some of the hardest working people, I believe, in this valley. And, um, you know, as you have an opportunity, I would encourage you to encourage our team. They do it for the Lord, but they do it because they love you too. And sometimes when you serve God, there's a, a physical, there is a physical cost to it. And I think the Apostle Paul was like, you know what? The outward man is perishing. We're not all like bummed out about it. We're not all consumed by it because it's not our focus. I remember when we church planted in New England, there were two, um, there were two huge gatherings of people that I would drive by on my way to church every Sunday morning. The first gathering was at Home Depot on Sunday morning. Like if you want to know where people are at in New Hampshire, number one is Home Depot because they're fixing their house. And number two was Gold's Gym. That was the second place where everybody in uh, Bedford was at. They were fixing this house. And I just want to remind all of us that thank God for the blessing of this mortal body, but this mortal body is not the focus. We're so consumed with this mortal body. I don't know if you heard in the news this last week, but apparently Scientists have discovered um, a gene that regenerates limbs. Did you hear this? Yeah. So, you know, there are certain um, amphibious creatures where if you cut their tail off, the tail grows back. Scientists have discovered that that gene exists within human beings as well, but it has been switched off. I know. It's been switched off. (laughs) Don't get excited about this because this just sounds really weird. It sounds like a bad B movie to me. But they're saying, hey, you can switch this gene back on. It's like this gene controls all of these other genes. And this one gene being switched off, they said, is like the whole house being dark. But they're trying to work out ways where they can switch the gene back on, maybe even possibly putting human beings in a place where they would be able to grow limbs back. I don't know. That's disturbing. I think that Jesus Christ will come back. I hope so. I think, you know, it would be great if he came back before any of that ever even happened. You know what I'm talking about. That's just weird. But he says, we're not losing heart. Even though we see this physical tent is perishing, is fading away, he says, on the other hand, the inward man is being renewed day by day. Look what matters the most to God is the inward man or the inward woman, that nature, that new nature that God has placed in you. And you know what God does every single day? He is renewing it. God is doing a renewing work in your life. Some of you need it. Some of, some of you are weary. Some of you are exhausted. Some of you are broken down. Some of you are on your last leg. Some of you are on your last lap. You feel like you can't even go on. Well, listen, this is what God will do every day. He will renew you. He will strengthen you. This word means to reinvigorate. It means to revive. All of that is found in the presence of God. You know, the place for reviving for me is my devotional time as the scriptures are open, as I'm patiently waiting for God to speak to me, that is the place that my cup is filled. 
My cup is filled when we gather together and we are worshiping God as a family and we are praising him with all of our hearts. You know, those are the moments where God fills you. The desire of God is not that you would be so overwhelmed by the suffering in your life that you would want to give up. God wants to reinvigorate you. God wants to strengthen you. Maybe you need that tonight. Ask him. Ask and seek and knock. It is the heart of God to do that to you and to do that in you because God's interest is in your inner person to grow you and to mature you and to develop you and to shape you into the image of his son. I want to encourage you tonight to invest in what matters. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the other stuff God will add to you. So Paul says, look, we, 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 are, we are looking through the lens of reality. We know what matters. We know what doesn't matter. If you flip this upside down, you will never serve God because you will have an inverted sense of value. He had a right sense of value. He was focused on the inside, not the outside. He goes on and he says, you know, for our light affliction, which is just for a moment, it's interesting to me that Paul could refer to his um, suffering as a light affliction, you know, being beaten, being stoned, being shipwrecked, in hunger, um, thirsty, fasting, being bitten by snakes, being bitten by rods, all of that. He's like, he's like, eh, <laughs> eh, you know, it's nothing, you know, I mean, that's just a small thing. Like how in the world could the apostle Paul look at his suffering? You know how it is sometimes with us, like we, we stub our toe and it's like the world is falling apart. We're like, Jesus, can't you come back? I'm in pain. Don't you see my suffering? You know, dink, dink, dink. Ah, ah, God, where are you in my life? Why didn't you control the hammer? And the Apostle Paul goes through it, and he's like, you know what? It's not really a big deal. It's not a big deal. Like, if I'm the Apostle Paul, I'm like, can we make a movie out of this? Because people need to know how much I've suffered. This is just rough. Everyone should know. Paul's like, eh, it doesn't matter. And I think that the Apostle Paul was like that. The Apostle Paul didn't wear his suffering like a badge on his shoulder. He wasn't telling everybody his story. He didn't need to make a movie. He didn't need to record it and then get the word out. He didn't post it on social media. But he didn't have to do those things because he always compared what he went through with what Jesus went through. And when you look at your own suffering and compare it to what Christ suffered for you, what is it that we have to complain about? What is it that we have to boast about? You know, beaten with rods three times, it hurt. Shipwrecked three times, probably uncomfortable. Stoned to death, absolutely painful. Dying for the sins of the world, incomparable, incomparable. I think that the Apostle Paul was so moved by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, he probably never even wanted to bring up his suffering. <laughs> He never wanted to, we'll get through this service tonight, I promise, I promise. You know, normally when this uh, rolls out like this, somebody in the congregation really needs to hear this message. I'm not saying that the devil is always behind uh, technology issues, but he might be tonight. He might be tonight. Anyway, listen, when you compare what you go through, there's no, there's no badge of honor. There's no um, having to broadcast it. Why? Because, you know, for what we go through, what is it in comparison to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? Years ago, I remember Pastor Chuck saying, and this really blessed me, he said, you know what, I've never really done anything for the Lord. And, you know, I leaned in when he said that. I'm like, man, you know, how could you say that after how powerfully that God has used you? You know, over a thousand churches planted in the United States thousands more internationally, radio stations. I mean, all these things that God did through him. And yet he had, you know, he said that he never really did anything for God. And then he closed that sentence by saying, you know, compared to what Jesus Christ has done for me, I really haven't done anything for him. And I just think it's good for us to always keep in mind what the Lord has done for us. Our suffering when compared to the cross really is nothing. I'm not minimizing what you're going through tonight, but we need to keep it in perspective. And not only that, 
He says, it's just for a moment. It's just for a moment. Now listen, when you're going through pain, it doesn't seem like it's just for a moment. It, it seems like it's going to last forever. But I want to remind you tonight that your suffering is not eternal unless you've not put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. If you've put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, you will inherit heaven, and he is going to wipe away every tear. There's going to be no more pain. There's going to be no more suffering. He is going to take it away. The former things will have passed away, the Bible says, and behold, all things will be new. You know, when we keep this eternal perspective, it enables us, and I would say um, it even inspires us to live for things that matter, to trust in the Lord, to lay our lives down, because we know this life is just a vapor, and we're here for a moment, but the things that we do on this earth will last forever. forever. Not only that, he says in the same verse, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us. So the next thing I would like to say to you is every circumstance in your life is working for you. Listen, it is working for you, not against you. Every circumstance, if you're a child of God and you are serving God with all of your heart, every circumstance in your life is working for you, not against you. I know sometimes this is what you think when you're suffering. God, how can this have any meaning? God, how can this have any purpose? This just doesn't make any sense to me. And let me remind you tonight, what doesn't make sense to you makes perfect sense to God. Can I say it again? What doesn't make sense to you makes perfect sense to God. In other words, God knows. God knows what he is doing. God knows what he is allowing. And if you've submitted yourself to him and you really believe that he's in control, then he is able to take everything in your life, even the adversity, even the difficulty, you know, we, we have this thing about being in control, and the truth is this, control is just an illusion. We are in control of nothing. You know, we, we think, I just was talking to my daughter the other day, she has a friend whose boyfriend, 19-year-old kid, uh, just died, and I said to her, you know, honey, like we assume so much in life, we believe that we're in control of so much and we can't even control the breath that is given to us by God. Every circumstance in your life is working. It's working for you, not against you. God uses it all. Romans 8, 18 says this, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Let me just read that to you again. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The final thing I'd like to say about this is that we walk by faith. You know, we're not people who focus on what is seen. We are people who focus on what is not seen. And the Bible says that we walk by faith, not by sight. We know that there is a whole world beyond what is seen um, that God is working in. And we trust by faith that God knows exactly what he is doing. And this is what he's doing in your life. The exceeding and eternal weight of glory is this. He is molding and shaping you into the image of his son. This is the value. You say, what is the value of all of this suffering? What is the value of all this difficulty? You know, what's it really worth, pastor? I step out in faith, and you know what? This is what happens. I get it from the outside in the unbelieving world, and even sometimes Christians oppose what I'm doing um, as I'm serving the Lord. Where's the value in it? Well, the value is in all of it. He is shaping you and molding you to look like his son, Jesus Christ. And sometimes that shaping process comes through suffering. It comes when God heats your life up. It comes when God scrapes the impurities away from you. You know, it's in those times of difficulty that those things that are not pleasing to God are often revealed in our lives. And that's when the Holy Spirit addresses them and sanctifies us and removes those things from us. It's kind of like the process for refining silver. You've heard this before. The silversmith will take the raw silver 
He'll put it in the cauldron. He'll heat it up. He or she will heat it up. All the dross, you know how this goes, all the elements that um, shouldn't be in the raw silver float to the top. He takes a long stick and he scrapes off the dross. He allows that silver to cool. He heats it up again. The impurities float to the top. He scrapes the dross off again. He repeats this process until the silver is purified. And he knows, the silversmith knows when the silver's, silver's purified, um, when he can look into the silver and see his perfect reflection. And this is what God's doing in your life. God is heating you up, your raw material, he's heating you up. The difficulty causes the dross to float to the top. He scrapes it away and he, he allows you to go through this process. God is a God of process. There's times I wish that wasn't the case. There are times where I wish God would just snap his fingers and the work would be done. But, you know, there'd be no demonstration of love on our part if that was the case. We stay on the wheel. We submit ourselves to the process. And God puts us through what he desires to put us through so one day he will look at us and we will bear the perfect image of his son. There is nothing that you are going through in this life that is not valuable in the eyes of God or to the eyes of God. He is at work. He is faithful. Listen, don't shrink back into your shell. Don't seek comfort. You know, stretch out. Walk by faith. Be motivated by your love for Jesus Christ. Have a passion. Care about the eternal souls that are lost around you. Be moved by God's love. And when the opposition and difficulty comes, rejoice in it because you've been counted worthy to suffer with Jesus Christ. And because in that difficulty, God is making you look more like his son. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this portion of scripture. And um, it is a powerful, beautiful portion of scripture that we're just so grateful for. And we all need to hear it. We all need to hear it. God, there are times where we just want to, we want to like shrink back into the shell. We want to hide in the hole. We want to escape to the cave. We want to insulate ourselves from difficulty. But God, we choose not to do that because we love you. We choose not to do that because, God, we know the souls around us are valuable to you, and you've divinely placed unsaved people in our life not so that we can avoid the opportunity, but God, so that we can take it. I pray tonight that you would encourage the hearts and souls here tonight, that you lift up your people and strengthen them, that by mercy, God, you would supply the reviving that's needed, the reviving, God, to weary hearts, God, to those who may, they just feel like they're on their last lap, they're ready to, Throw the towel in. Father, tonight, would you be gracious and do what only you're able to do. God, supply it. Pour it forth from heaven. Fill the cup tonight. Anoint the head with oil. Draw your children to green pastures. Lead them to still waters. God, revive the souls in this place tonight and mobilize us. God, is your people for the work that you've set before us in these last days. Tonight, as our eyes are closed, as our heads are bowed, maybe this evening you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. You know, you're here tonight, and that's good. But you know, you've never really depended on Christ for the salvation of your own soul. You've never looked to Jesus. Maybe tonight you've come broken and, and in need. You've come searching You've come tonight hoping that there's an answer, there's a solution to your problems, and tonight there is a solution. It's not the church. It's not a pastor. It's not you fixing your life morally. The solution, the answer is Jesus Christ. He's present tonight. He loves you. And he endured the cross for your sake that you could be 
reconciled to God. By that, I just simply mean that your broken relationship with God could be mended. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We, by our actions, have broken our relationship with God, and we need forgiveness. And God extends forgiveness to us through the sacrifice of his son. God loved you so much, he delivered his own son. Death could not hold him down. He made a perfect sacrifice, and God raised him from the dead victoriously on the third day. Tonight, do you need to put trust and faith in Jesus? Do you need to surrender your life to God? Do you need to come humbly to him, asking for forgiveness, leaning on him for strength? This evening, if this is you, and you would say, you know what, Derek, that is me, and I, I don't want to spend another day without God. I have all of these issues and problems, and tonight I realize that Jesus Christ is the solution. I want to take a step of faith. I want to believe in him. I want a new work of God in my life. Tonight, if this is you, right where you're sitting, I want to pray for you. And I'm just going to ask you tonight, would you raise your hand? If you want to take a step of faith and trust in Jesus Christ for the very first time tonight, stretch your hand up high. Let me see who you are. Awesome. I see your hand in the center in the back. Thank you. Anybody else? Tonight, if you're a Christian and you need to rededicate your life to the Lord, maybe there is a weariness and, and uh, you feel like throwing in the towel and maybe that's because you're back in the things of this world and you know the world has, has sucked all of your energy and your passion and desire for God just sucked it away. And tonight you, you need spiritual renewal. You need to focus your life again on what matters. You need to reestablish your values. You need to value God and your relationship with him. And God tonight wants to give you a brand new beginning, a fresh start. And if this is you tonight and you'd say, Pastor, you know what? I need to get right. I need to come home. I've been prodigal. I want to get right with my heavenly father. This evening, if this is you, would you raise your hand? I want to pray for you too. Just stretch your hand up high tonight. Let me see who you are. Awesome. Thank you so much. Right here in the front, over here on my left. Anybody else? Father, thank you. God, thank you for these precious souls, God, that you love so much. And thank you for speaking to them tonight. We pray that you would bless them now as they take this step of faith. Right where you're sitting tonight, I want to lead you in a very simple prayer. Um, in this prayer, you're going to turn away from sin. You're going to turn to God. In this prayer tonight, you're going to trust in Jesus Christ for the saving of your soul. In this prayer tonight, you're going to confess your desire to be a disciple and to follow Christ all the days of your life. And so this evening, very simply, I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. God, tonight, I give you my life. Father, confessing that I've sinned against you, but God, turning away from my sin, and tonight, believing in Jesus, that he died on the cross for me, and that he rose again, and that through faith in him, you have forgiven me, and God, you have made me your child. Tonight, I commit to you my life to live for your glory. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.